Good afternoon. I'd like to talk to you about a dual channel 26 gigahertz PA for the 5G Pioneer Band. Now we've been working on millimeter wave 5G for a number of years and the frequency of operations are starting to become a little bit clearer. In the US we see people rolling out trial systems at 28 gigahertz and 37 and 39 gigahertz. In Europe, the Radio Spectrum Policy Group went away, had some discussions, and came up and decided that the 26 gigahertz Pioneer Band would be the band for Europe. And they're encouraging all European nations to keep part of this band free for future millimeter wave 5G. Now, when this announcement was made, we looked around and we realised that there weren't huge numbers of components addressing this band commercially available. And so we developed this uh, PA targeting the 26 gigahertz 5G Pioneer band. Now, Plastic RFI doesn't sell standard products, but not all of the clients who we do design work for are happy for us to speak about the work we've done. So we sometimes do some extra work that we can talk about, and this is a case in point. We developed the PA MMIC. We had it manufactured on one of our mass sets, and then we measured it on wafer. After this, we came up with the idea of developing a dual channel custom laminate SMT package, and we worked with Filtronic and the compound semiconductor applications catapult to do this. So this is the bird dam. It's a nice crisp clean photograph here at the bottom. It has two output devices. The red pointer, one here, one here. Now you'll always see with microwave, millimeter wave PAs, a number of output devices power combined. And that, that's because you can't really just make one huge device because the parasitics of the transistor increase as the unit width of the number of fingers increase. So the gain starts to drop off. So it, it's a trade-off between gain and output power. So we choose these two sensitive sound devices. We combine them. And these, these are dread from total short tracks. You know, these are a few hundred microns. You're way beyond being able to do things on a PCB with different <coughs> components when you've got these of these sort of things. We've got another device, same sort of size drive, and a smaller device at the end pop. And right here at the end pop, we've got a, uh, a game compensation network where we flatten the game response. And we've got RF and wafer pads at the output and input for RF and wafer test. This is a little coupler. Very short, it's a more shortened coupler. Still has some directivity, but it's shorter than the quarter of a wavelength because we don't want to waste that area. And that allows us to monitor the RF output power. And the overall die is three and a half times 1.2. Now we we'll put this on a multi project mass set along with some other stuff we would do with one of our clients. So we, we have extended the input here. So we were to do a custom version of just this die could be a little bit smaller. It was realized on a 0.15 micron cape length PM process from wind semiconductors. 22 dB of game, I'll show you some results. P1 dB of about 26 dB. PAE of 30%, now that's the PAE at P1 dB. And that, that's just there for a, a figure of merit, really, a, a yardstick to, to show you what the IC does. And what you discover is for millimeter wave PAs, 30 to 35 percent at P1 dB, it's about what you've got to get for the efficiency. And then when you back it off, the efficiency drops. Now we spent a lot of effort trying to get this to our good efficiency at back off. I think we went for 60 dB back off in the end, is the point we took. When we design millimeter wave PAs for, for 5G applications, People ask us, it varies, he was doing the asking, but it's between 6 and 9 dB back off. All of them are operating back off. And you design differently when you're trying to optimise for efficiency at back off than if you just want to optimise for efficiency 
when you're saturating the amplifier as you might in a, a radar application. This is just a little schematic of a power detector. But there's nothing hugely innovative here, but it works very well. So we have a coupler here. <coughs> this is a coupled port, a port of a printed coupler, backward wave coupler, and we detect the signal here. We've got a reference diode over here, which is exactly the same as this one. We apply a little bit of trickle current through this. When there's no power coming through, these have the same voltage across them. As we start to transmit power here, the voltage here drops. We take the difference between them, and as you'll see later, this gives a very good temperature compensated uh, measurement of the power being transmitted. This shows you the measured S parameter. And then the dash trace here is the simulated S21. And there's the measured gain and the <coughs> measured S12 is the purple trace. And the S2, S22 is obviously optimized for a load impedance to give the best PEF back off, because that's what we're aiming for. And the S11 is very well matched. And the gain slope compensation network on the input helps you to achieve that. So we see a gain across the, the 24 to 28 gigahertz band, which is slightly wider than the um, 26 gigahertz pioneer band. This was our design band, and it just operated over this band anyway, so we didn't use any of our contingency guard band. We see an S11 at better than 13 B, and an S22 at better than 10. Here's five of these amplifiers, all measured um, <coughs> on the PNA, and the red trace is the simulated, the five measured parts were just random parts across a wafer. And you see that they land right all, all over the top of each other. And uh, fortunately, the simulated is, is close to the measured as well. Um, this is the on wafer measured power compression. And what we see, there's only three points here, which is why the slightly strange states, measured at the bottom of the band, middle of the band, and the top of the band. And we see we've got a P1DB of about 26 dBm. That's the left hand axis. And a P1DB efficiency, which is the blue trace on the right hand axis, varies a little bit across the band, about 30%. The PAE at 60 dB back off is about 9%, which sounds low, but in honesty, that's very good. It's difficult to achieve that level of PAE at that level of back off. And that's why people adopt doherty amplifiers and uh, digital pre-distortion for example this shows the rf one wafer measured uh, performance load signal performance the pae versus um, uh, measured <coughs> models is the red traces and the output power is the blue so you can see we were simulating slightly more output power than we measured um, this was an on wafer cw measurement so it wasn't an ideal thermal environment for that. Um, the PAE uh, trace agrees a little bit more. The back off here is on the <coughs> axis, so the no PB point here is the P1 dB point. Now, this is um, a photograph that Filtronic gave to me and it shows an array of these custom laminate packages. This isn't the laminate package we use, I'm going to show you that one, we designed a custom package. But this is nice because it shows you how it's made, and these are the lids over on this side, they're made in the same laminate material. And then you, make, you, you have the bottoms over on the right side, an array of those, and you assemble the die onto the, onto the package bottoms, you bond them up, and then you attach the lid to the top with epoxy and you end up with a QFN laminate component. This is an example. This is something we did um, for a client of ours. Filtronic, this was for a 5G trial system. Filtronic has manufactured over 10,000 of these. This was for a trial system. Uh, th there's absolutely tons of stuff going on out there. People are spending gazillions of pounds developing 5G. And I, for one, am delighted. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the laminate package of our dual channel PA. Now this is the package base, and you can see here this this is the thick metal bottom. So that's a solid copper base 
that will be attached to the PCB. These are the DC tracking, very simple, coming out here. Here, these strangely shaped bits, they're the RF tracking. And we didn't make it a strange shape because we thought it looked quite nice. You have to carefully design that shape and, and it, it is genuinely really easy to get it wrong. But we, we spent some time and effort <coughs> cunningly crafting this shape and this works very well. When you get the package all sealed up, this is what it looks like. That's the underside, that's the top side. And we've got two of these PAs in one package. So two RF inputs, two RF outputs. And this little slide is uh, an example of some of the detail that will go in. So this is the design of the RF transition over the dial. So you have a dial here and you have a foam pad, and you select the foam pad, make it quite wide, for two reasons. One, so you can get multiple bone wires to it. We made it wide enough to get three bone wires. That allows you to keep the series in the as well. But also, you optimize <coughs> the size, so it has a nice parasitic capacitance. Over on the package side, you optimize the shape of this side, so it also has a nice capacitance. And then you end up with CLC, and that's a low-pass filter. As long as you make this bone wire reductance low enough, you can optimize these capacitances here, so it's that you get a beautiful transition. And I'll show you how nicely this works in one of the upcoming slides. Here's two die in the package. You can see here, we've just bonded across this die. For other parts, we've packaged this dual channel. We, we, we've done two versions, we've done a flip chip version. I didn't in this plane, but I just never had enough space on the wafer. We wouldn't have been able to get enough dye out for our customer who was paying for the wafer, and that would have been a bit mean. So we, we just bonded it across like this, and in honesty, it's only the DC, and you cannot tell the difference between them. You can see the three bomb wires, very nice attention to detail here. See, very short, tight bonds, and that's what you need. And uh, we knew what this bone wire profile was going to be like. We even simulated that. We even simulated all of this package structure. Here is one of our evaluation PCBs. This is our dual QFM package. It's a seven millimeter by seven millimeter packet. It's got two of these PA die in like this. We've got an RF in here, RF out here. Or up in here, or up here. These are two DC connectors which have the uh, voltage detection for the uh, transmitted RF power and the bias voltages in it here. We also did a TRL calibration PCB over here. And that <coughs> allows you to calibrate to the center of this line, which is twice the length of one of these. And so when you then measure S parameters, the calibrated to the ports of this package. When you're presenting data for a package component, you want to present the data of the component soldered down onto a representative PCB. That's what's important. If anyone ever shows you data for a package which they've RF and wafer probe upside down, you should question and say, well, that's okay, that's great, but that's not how we're gonna use the package. We're gonna use it on a PCB. That's where it needs to work well. We made some cables up. This is a photograph of our cables. <laughs> and then we, we, take, we, we, we wired them into some power supplies where you measure the performance. This is the performance of two channels, A and B. And these weren't selected die. These were randomly selected die of, of, of two parts of the wafer. We're not entirely sure where someone in Taiwan picked these chips off and put them in a package. Uh, but you can see, you know, really nice agreement. <coughs> Then, what we can see here is the agreement with the RF and wafer. Now you can see the RF and wafer data. The S21 virtually overlays. The S11 and the S22 are still pretty good, still in good agreement. And that shows the benefits of the care and attention to detail of that RF transition design. Um, on one half, well that doesn't look very good. All you've shown us there is not changed. But believe me, it's really hard to put a 28 gigahertz IC into an SMT package and for it not to change. 
This, we measured the performance on the temperature as well. What's in the oven? When we took the temperature down, that's the blue trace, the gain went up. When we took the temperature up, the gain went down. And this is what happens. But it all worked nicely at all the temperatures. The matches didn't change very much. And we measured it from minus 40 degrees centigrade to plus 85 degrees centigrade. We also did a whole bunch of power measurements. Uh, this is the power compression transit characteristics um, at three temperatures. 25 in green, minus 40 in blue, plus 85 in red. And what we found <coughs> is that at um, low temperatures, the power went up a tiny bit. Um, and at red temperatures, at the hot temperatures, it went down a little bit. Compared to the package performance, we found that at the um, high frequency, the power went up. At the um, low frequency, it was about the same. Mid band, it dropped a little bit. And this shows the power added efficiency versus output power at the three temperatures. And you can see it, it, at P1 dB now, we've got 25% um, at um, 25 degrees. 27 at P1 dB and 23 at the hot temperature. Interestingly, the mid-band power, that, that, um, mid power here was about the lowest. It actually improved at the top of the band once it was in a pattern. This is showing you the power um, measurement data. So this is the, um, the logarithm of the detected voltage. So it's the detected the voltage of the detector diode <coughs> minus the voltage of the reference diode. And along the bottom is the P out in here. And if you plot this voltage on a log scale, then you get these linear curves here. And what you can see is there's very little difference across the three temperatures showing the benefits of the power um, of the contemporary <coughs> station scheme. Then we looked at the IP3. And it, the IP3 is very nice. So we designed this amplifier for good IP3 at back off. That's what people are interested in. And actually, the IP3 is about 9 to 10 dB higher than the P1 dB, which is pretty good for um, the gas P and MMIC. So, a few conclusions. We developed the custom laminate QFM package to house two 26 gigahertz PA die with a dual package. Uh, a dual channel component. We had these manufactured, assembled, we designed some evaluation PCBs, had them solder attached to the evaluation PCB. Then we did a bunch of measurements on the package components. You see that the RF performance of the package die is very good. It covers 24 to 28 gigahertz, which encompasses the full 26 gigahertz 5G pioneer band. Gain response very similar to the RF and wafer. Slight improvement in S22 um, at the top of the band. Slight degradation in S11. But all in all, very nice package response. The P1DB, we see a slight improvement at the top of the band, <coughs> to about 26.2 dBA. Low end of the band is unchanged, 26.6. And mid band, the slight degradation, 25.4. Very good IP3, 9 to 10 dB better than the P1DB. And we see that the off on chip temperature compensated power detector works very nicely. That's all I was planning on saying.